Hello and happy Lord's Day to everybody. Welcome back to our study of 1 Corinthians. And we're returning to 1 Corinthians this week. Uh, last week, I took a week off from uh, from studying, well, a week off from preaching 1 Corinthians uh, to give me an extra week to study today's text. Um, trying to wrap my head around 1 Corinthians 11, verses 2 through 16. Um, get some more reading done about it, some more thinking done about it. Um, so last week we talked about baptism, um, but we are ready to come back to 1 Corinthians this week. Um, over the course of the past week, uh, reading through various things, um, reading through some commentaries, reading through the, um, the homilies of some of the church fathers, um, really the best that I've been able to determine on this text is that nobody agrees fully on what the text is about, uh, because it has a lot of ins and outs. Um, everybody just agrees that it's a difficult text in the sense that it creates difficulties no matter what interpretation you settle on for it, uh, mainly because of the way that it interacts with uh, chapter 14, verses 34 and 35, um, and the matter of silence in the church. Um, part of the difficulty for me personally in approaching this text as a preacher is that I don't want this series to be a class on 1 Corinthians. Um, these are sermons on 1 Corinthians, which means that you know, I think they ought to focus more on exhortation, on our behavior, um, and shouldn't spend a whole lot of time out in the weeds. Uh, that's something that is, uh, is more suitable for a Bible class. Um, plus, I have done a... Um, you know, more of a class-style exposition of this text before, uh, during our uh, one of our monthly Q and A's. Um, I think it was for it was either March or May of 2019. Um, if it was May 2019, so if you're watching this uh, on YouTube, I'll make sure to put that in the cards, um, so that if you are curious for a little more detail on the text or the interpretation of the text, uh, you can go there and review that Q and A. Um, in that Q&A, the main thing that I did was try to identify what context Paul is speaking to, uh, and in short, my conclusion there was that Paul was probably not talking about the worship assembly um, in this passage, but is probably addressing behavior that's going on in a private setting, um, which is kind of an idiosyncratic view. It's, well, it's fairly common in the Churches of Christ. Um, not common at all outside of the churches of Christ. Um, so, and, and I think, and, and by the way, my the past weeks or the past couple of weeks study on this passage, um, I've not really come up with. Um, well, it's not changed my mind about the context any. Um, I'll say that it's made my view somewhat more idiosyncratic. Um, I think what I'm going to do is a, uh, I'll prepare an extra video um, that is more of a class style treatment of this passage, one where we really do get out in the weeds and oh goodness knows how long <laughs> that video will be. It'll probably be like an hour and a half or something. Because uh, there are a lot of weeds in this passage uh, to, uh, to sift through and figure things out. Um, in today's message, though, just to cut to the chase, I want us to focus more on the attitude that Paul is calling people to in today's text, both men and women. Um, although, you know, today's text is directed specifically at women. Um, there is an attitude here that I think everybody in the church um, should should strive to attain and also an attitude to avoid. Um, so without any further ado, let's turn our attention to today's text, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verses 2 through 16. Now I commend you because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions even as I delivered them to you. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, the head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. 
Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. But every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, since it is the same as if her head were shaven. For if a wife will not cover her head, then she should cut her hair short. But since it is disgraceful for a wife to cut off her hair or shave her head, let her cover her head. For a man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God. But woman is the glory of man. For man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. That is why a wife ought to have a symbol of authority on her head, because of the angels. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman. For as woman was made from man, so man is now born of woman, and all things are from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a wife to pray to God with her head uncovered? Doesn't nature itself teach you that if a man wears long hair, it is a disgrace to him? But if a woman has long hair, it is her glory? For her hair is given to her for a covering. If anyone is inclined to be contentious, we have no such practice, nor do the churches of God. All right. So like we have been doing in 1 Corinthians, let's talk about what the problem is at Corinth. And remember, Corinth usually has at least two layers of problem, right? What they are actually doing, so like what's, what's being manifested in their behavior. And then there's usually a deeper problem, an attitude problem, where they have wandered away from the gospel in their hearts. And that's causing the behavioral problem. Now, the funny thing about this text, um, in some places it's harder to discern, well, what's the heart issue that's going on? Um, because usually Paul is talking, well, Paul pretty much always talks about um, the explicit behavior that's going on. In this particular text, it's the, it's the behavior that's the difficult part, figuring out exactly what's going on um, and exactly what it has to say about our behavior. Um, the attitude that is going on in this passage is honestly not so difficult to figure out. I think it's it's relatively easy to understand. Um, so I want to treat this in fairly general terms today, uh, because whatever specifically is going on at Corinth boils down to women, probably married women, in some way dishonoring men, probably their husbands. Um, again, I don't want to wander too far out into the weeds here. Um, but this dishonoring is happening in the course of praying and prophesying. Again, I think this is probably happening in a, pri happening in a private context. Uh, but what we're going to have to talk about today uh, would be true if this was going on in the worship assembly as well. Um, now, in what we've just said, you know, it might sound like we're picking on women. Um, we should note that Paul also gives instructions concerning men in this passage. And he warns them against dishonoring Christ in the way that they pray and prophesy. Um, but even here, by the way, it's not entirely clear what practice Paul is warning against. And there's a lot of debate over that as well. Uh, but the central concern of this passage, as you're reading through, um, the, the sense of this passage is that the central problem has to do with what the Corinthian women are doing. Again, it's not saying that women in general are a problem. Um, it's just that in this particular church, in this particular circumstance, uh, they are the ones causing the problem in this particular way. Um, uh, the problem is the way that the women are treating their men in the context of praying and prophesying. And this problem is with how people are treating their heads. And here Paul is engaging in some wordplay. Um, and it's wordplay that you know, works in English as well as Greek, right? The, it, in English, just like in Greek, head has at least a double meaning to it. Um, you can use head at a, a literal physical level, um, you know, talking about your noggin, um, or you can use it on a metaphorical level. Now, the problem, um, and what I want us to consider here for a moment, is what Paul means by this metaphor and what the Corinthians would have understood Paul 
to mean. Because just because a, a word uh, can have a double meaning in two languages doesn't mean that it has the same double meaning in those languages. And so let's spend a little time dwelling on this comparison that Paul makes. Um, he doesn't just give us the metaphor, right, where a, you know, a woman is dishonoring her head by not covering her head, right, so dishonoring her metaphorical head by not covering her physical head. Uh, men, you know, can dishonor their head, Christ, you know, so their, their metaphorical head by covering their physical head. Um, Paul makes this comparison, though, on that basis, um, in talking about heads. He makes this comparison between the husband and the wife on the one hand, so the way the wife is treating her head, her metaphorical head, her husband, and on the other hand, God and Christ. So the way that Christ um, relates to God the Father as his head. And that's something that Paul lays out pretty explicitly at the beginning of the text. Um, in fact, that's the very first thing that he says. I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, the head of a wife is her husband, the head of Christ is God. And notice, by the way, how he, how he treats that out of order. It doesn't seem like Paul's really interested in establishing a hierarchy here, or else he would start with uh, with what he ended with, right? Um, and you would frame it a little differently if you were trying to establish a hierarchy. Um, you would either start at the bottom and go to the top or start at the top and go to the bottom. Paul does neither. He kind of starts in the middle and works out in both directions and kind of hops back and forth a little bit. Um, the head of every man is Christ. The head of a wife is her husband. The head of Christ is God. Instead of saying God is the head of Christ, Christ is the head of man, man is the head of woman. Or, um, you know, the head of a woman is her husband, the head of every man is Christ, the head of Christ is God. It's out of order. Um, and that suggests something to us um, that is also suggested by the, the theology of this passage. Some good theology, I think, is going to help us understand what Paul is getting at here. Because in English head as a metaphor usually means something akin to chief or ruler, with the focus being on that hierarchical relationship. And so when we read something like this, and in fact, if you go back to that May 2009 Q&A, I, even I fell into it um, at one point in the Q&A. Um, I just unconsciously rearranged the text, putting it up on the, uh, on the whiteboard. Um, and didn't really think anything of it. Um, because there's this assumption that head means boss, right? Your head is your superior. But again, that doesn't seem to be what Paul is getting at here. Um, you know, we see the order in which he has put things. But mainly, that kind of relationship, chief or ruler or su especially superior, is not how we understand the relationship between the Father and the Son, right? between Christ and God, as Paul phrases it in the passage. The Son is distinct from the Father, but he never declares independence from the Father, nor does the Father ever declare independence from the Son. And then here's the important bit, and Paul himself tells us this elsewhere, that the Son, Christ, is equal to the Father. He is equal to God. But Christ never asserts that equality. Instead, he empties himself. Right? So whenever I say he never asserts it, I mean he doesn't, he doesn't act on it in the way that we would expect someone to act on it. He doesn't stand on his dignity, as it were. Instead, Paul tells us, he empties himself. Right? And John records for us in his gospel uh, that Christ says, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, that is, when you've crucified him, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. These kinds of statements are all over John's gospel, by the way. 
where Christ uh, says that he doesn't do anything on his own authority. He doesn't speak on his own authority. He's not coming up with the words himself. He is speaking and acting based on what his Father wills for him. Now, is it because the Father is superior to the Son? No. Again, Paul has told us already uh, that, uh, that Christ is equal with God, that the Son is equal to the Father. Um, and this is where, again, good theology helps us out, uh, because if we, if we run with some bad theology, um, and, and John Chrysostom spends a lot of time focused on this in his homily on this passage, um, it's really easy to just run ourselves into heresy about the nature of Christ, um, that he is some subordinate being, lower than God, which is not what we confess about Jesus at all. Um, now, with that understanding that Christ relates to God as an equal who does not assert, assert his equality, but rather takes God's lead, as it were, or follows God's lead, um, that tells us something about the rest of this comparison. And that's what Paul is setting up here. Not setting up a hierarchy, but setting up a comparison. Right? We understand the, re the relationship between man and Christ in the same way that we understand the relationship between wife and husband and the relationship between Christ and God. We are not to understand those relationships in the sense of a master-slave relationship or a boss-lackey relationship. You know, no more than we would, I mean, we don't understand the husband-wife relationship uh, in that way any more than we would describe the relationship between the father and the son that way. Again, that's, that's heresy as far as Jesus is concerned. Um, and so what's, what does Paul mean by headship here? Well, authority, and again, we tip, well, we almost exclusively think of authority when we look at this passage in particular and the way it talks about headship. Uh, authority is certainly involved. Again, Christ himself says, I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. So authority is involved. But when you look at the relationship between the Son and the Father, you recognize that it's not the whole ball of wax. And in fact, it's not even necessarily the defining characteristic of that kind of relationship. Um, because what does Christ say by the end of Matthew's gospel? All authority has been given to me on heaven and on earth. Right? And it's so the Father and the Son, again, being equal, share authority. Um, and yet, the Son acknowledges his Father as his head in some way. The headship of the Father is a matter of prominence. The son identifies himself with the father and aligns himself with the father. And again, if just for a, a master class in this, just read through the Gospel of John again. Right? I feel like at this point in the sermon, we probably could just go back and, and go all through the Gospel of John if we really wanted to go through it. How Jesus is constantly identifying himself with the father. But he gives the father the preeminent position. Again, we understand that they are equal, uh, and yet that is the, the honor, as it were, the glory uh, that Christ gives to the Father. And in return, the Father honors and glorifies the Son, and we see that likewise reflected in the Gospels. Right? And, and Jesus even frames it explicitly that way, right? that he has spent his time glorifying the Father, and now, Father, glorify your Son. Right, as he is praying and, and preparing to go to his death. The relationship between the Father and the Son is a matter of communion. And that's the kind of relationship that Paul is describing between a woman and her man in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And it tells us something about the problem, at least the heart problem, the attitude that's going on in Corinth. The problem is that some of the women at Corinth are dishonoring their men, dishonoring, I think, specifically their husbands, in the way that they are praying and prophesying. 
rather than, and again, exactly what that looks like, that, that's something for getting into the weeds. But rather than identifying themselves and aligning themselves with their husbands, they are asserting their independence from their husbands. In a, in a spiritual sense, they're flexing on their husbands. Right? You get the sense particularly, Paul talks about praying or prophesying. Um, so you're, we're talking about women who have the gift of prophecy uh, when that gift existed and was common in the church. Um, and you could imagine, I guess, what a, uh, for lack of a better word, what a trip that might be, what a rush that might be, particularly in a patriarchal culture um, such as you had in the first century. Um, it would be hard to imagine anyone in that kind of position, you know, whether we're talking, um, you know, woman existing in a patriarchy or, um, you know, a slave existing in a, um, a slave owning society or a, you know, ancient society as we've, as we've seen over and over again was highly, highly stratified. And it's hard to imagine somebody on the lower strata receiving such a powerful and amazing gift from God and not kind of losing their heads a little bit. Um, in fact, that I think that's part of the metaphor, um, if you'll excuse the playing in English, that uh, these, these women at Corinth have lost their heads a little bit. Um, the display that they are making in their praying and in their prophesying is one of disunion rather than one of communion. So rather than seeking the shared glory of their relationship, such as the Father and the Son share, they are seeking their own glory. Again, flexing on their husbands. Um, there's a part of the passage... By the way, if, if we're tempted to think that Paul is writing this to, quote-unquote, put women in their place um, and establish a hierarchy and establish subordination and subservience, um, particularly men over women in general, um, the next part of the passage, the middle part of the passage, is a corrective to that, starting from about verse 11. Um lest anyone take Paul the wrong way. He, he mentions the creation order of things once, right? That uh, man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. And again, um, if we are tempted to misunderstand what Paul means by that, he comes back around to the creation order of things again. He says, nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman. For as woman was made from man, so man is now born of woman, and all things are from God. So the only kind of subservience that he's trying to establish is the one that exists between us and God, right, where we are subservient to God. Um, he says, don't get me wrong on what I'm talking about from the creation account. I'm not saying that, uh, that man is independent of woman in any way. Creation itself, life itself, teaches us that men and women are not independent of each other. In particular, husbands and wives are not independent of each other. Rather, they are interdependent just as women and you go back go back to the first husband and wife just as and this is why i think it's husband and wife by the way because he's pointing back to adam and eve right this isn't just talking about men and women generally like he created a man and he created a woman they didn't really have anything to do with each other you know one was from venus the other was from mars etc no i mean he he created them to be wed the first humans were made to be joined in matrimony. And he shows us in that story that they are interdependent, that just as Eve was created from Adam, so new life arose through Eve. So the sons, Cain and Abel and Seth, are born 
from Eve. Now, Paul tells us that we are to understand this creation lesson spiritually. He says, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman. For as woman was made from man, so man is now born of woman. There is a spiritual lesson to learn here. In the life of the spirit, a woman is not independent of her husband, nor is a man independent of his wife. Instead, God has made us in such a way that we give life to each other. Right? That same story that played out between Adam and Eve plays out between us. Right? And again, I think Paul is talking specifically about husbands and wives, but this, this also expands out a little more broadly than just the marriage relationship. Uh, in fact, we're going to see it expand out more broadly than that uh, in the coming chapters of 1 Corinthians. Um, we are made for giving life to each other, right? Now, he has granted that in a special way, I think, in the marriage relationship. Um, and so, whenever you find, you know, one, uh, one member of the, uh, the couple that is more talented in some way, more, more spiritual, and, and remember, that's a big thing for the Corinthians. They have, uh, they've shown themselves to be kind of spiritually full of themselves elsewhere in the letter. So we're not surprised to find uh, women in Corinth who are full of themselves because of a spiritual gift that they have received. Um, and Paul has to call them back to the gospel. Right? Uh, what Paul has to say to them is completely of a piece with the gospel message that Paul has been presenting through the entire letter. Right? We, um, we saw this message of interdependence back in chapters 8 through 10. Right? Um, I'm talking about meat consecrated to idols. The way of faith is not just about what my own conscience allows me to do. Right? It's about what my actions do to other people's consciences. It's a matter of interdependence. Am I giving life to my brothers and sisters in Christ, or am I destroying that life? That's an explicit concern in chapters 8 through 10. Paul says, you're just thinking about yourself. You need to start thinking about others in the church. Here, we saw that kind of interdependence in several different ways with regard to the marriage relationship in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Uh, they're not just talking about spiritual things, uh, although spiritual things did come up in that chapter quite a bit. But uh, married couples, for example, shouldn't abstain from intimacy, in part because they are helping each other to guard against the temptations of the adversary. They are, in that way, spiritually giving each other life. Um, later on in the chapter, he talks about Christians who are married to non-Christians. And Paul says, don't seek to divorce. And one of the reasons that he gives is that the Christian spouse is consecrating his or her non-Christian spouse um, and consecrating the children, right? Their presence in the relationship is life-giving. Uh, we saw that call for interdependence also in chapter 6, that they should stop taking each other to court, right? Stop demanding their own rights, standing on their own dignity. In chapter 5, uh, where we see the uh, the sexual immorality of uh, you know the man having his father's wife, well, we see what that does. All right, the Corinth is treating that like it's basically like it's more or less a private concern. Right, they're not doing anything about it. They're not addressing it. They're letting it go. And one of the things that Paul calls them out for is that that sexual immorality from one man can have a destructive effect through the entire church, right? As we're about to, I'm going to plug the uh, the Bible class that we're about to start up, Lord willing, today. Um, we're going to be studying through the book of Joshua, right? You go to, uh, go to Joshua chapters 7 and 8, chapter 7 in particular, right? And, and Israel has been on an incredible streak of obedience. I mean, we'll, we'll talk about the significance of that, Lord willing, in class. Uh, but when they go up to fight against the city of Ai, there's one guy in the camp, Achan, 
one man who has broken faith with the Lord. And that one man jeopardizes the entire nation of Israel because of his sin. All right, interdependence is the gospel message all over the place. It's all over 1 Corinthians. It's all over the rest of the Bible, too. Um, I honestly wasn't planning on roping Achan into this, but here we are. Um, but this, this is the kind of message that Paul preaches on and on all the way back to the beginning of the letter. In fact, I want you to consider one of the very first lessons. In fact, it was the first lesson um, of 1 Corinthians, the very first thing that Paul called them out on. Um, this is, in fact, the overarching problem at Corinth. Um, all of the other problems are you know, part and parcel with this one overarching problem. The problem of factionalism that we read about. Um, let's turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We'll read verses 10 through 17 to remind us what's going on. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one may say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the house of Stephanus. But beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Right, the problem is division, um, and it's it's couched in terms of worldly wisdom, um, worldly power, worldly influence. You know, we've seen all of this confusion going on in everything that the Corinthians are doing, um, and. It leads them to divide against one another and to seek their own interests. Now, look, division can cut a lot of different ways, right? Paul names those specific factions in chapter 1. Um, but a lot of the division that we have seen so far through the letter, it comes in all kinds of different forms. Not just, you know, the Paul party versus the Apollos party versus the Peter party versus the Christ party. Um, I mean, that was certainly a thing going on in Corinth, but a lot of the division that we have seen in the letter up to this point has come from individualism, that is liberalism, uh, the idea that each person should be allowed to do as he or she pleases, that um, each person should um, have full expression of, of his or herself, should assert his or herself. And this is precisely the sort of thing that we find going on in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We find an assertion of selfhood that is dishonoring someone's uh, you know, brother in Christ. And, and we'll continue to see it, by the way. We, we see it with spiritual gifts in chapters 12 through 14. Next week, at the end of chapter 11, we'll see them... Um, even engaging in this kind of factionalism with regards to the Lord's Supper and basically making class distinctions um, in their taking of the Supper. What Paul is addressing here at the beginning of 1 Corinthians 11 is factionalism based on differences in sex. And that cuts different ways, right? It pits a wife against her husband, like we're seeing in this passage. It also pits men against women, and again, Paul is warning against that. In the Lord, neither is a woman independent of her husband, or, nor is a man independent of his wife. He warns both ways. So as he's always done, Paul calls us back to that pattern of the gospel. In the Lord, they are not independent of each other. We are not independent of each other. All right, so... Again, we're pointed back to creation. You know, woman was created from man. Man is born of woman. We're to understand the spiritual lesson from that, that in the church you cannot have one without the other. 
again, we're not to misunderstand what Paul has to say in this chapter as being about superiority versus inferiority, or else our theology is bad. And we're saying that uh, we're saying that the Father is superior to the Son, and that the Son is inferior to the Father. Um, right, and that is a that's a heretical understanding of Christ the Son. Um, instead of being a point about superiority and inferiority, Paul's point is about spiritual propriety, doing that which is proper. Um, specifically, with a view towards this interdependent relationship between husband and wife, between men and women. Um, so to state it simply, Paul is saying you are not free. You are not your own person. You are not some free-floating, untethered individual. Right? You have, you, know, you you are part of several relationships, and those relationships put you under obligation. And being in Christ does not free you from those obligations. Right? That's 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 the worldly sense of the word liberty. Right? Being freed from any obligation. That's the world's idea of liberty. That is not Christian liberty. In fact, Christian liberty almost always works in exactly that, the opposite direction of that. We are liberated from sin so that we can better meet the obligations of the relationships that we are in. So that we can be free to have the kind of relationship with other people that Christ has with the Father. So to sum up, the problem in 1 Corinthians 11 is not really at its at base level about whether or not women should put doilies on their heads in church. It's not about hairdos either, ultimately. Um, those arguments, I think, miss the overall point of the passage. The problem in 1 Corinthians 11 is people using spiritual practices to dishonor the relationships that they are in. Again, in Corinth's case, it's specifically uh, that the women are using praying and prophesying to dishonor their husbands. And that, that kind of behavior ought to be absolutely intolerable to us. Right now, we might be, you know, there's, there's a great deal of confusion as to what that looked like in Corinth. I suspect there's less confusion about what that might look like in 2020 America. Um, and I'm not going to wander out into the weeds on that. But use your judgment a little bit. I'll, I'll invite you to do the same thing that Paul invites the Corinthians to do. Judge for yourself. Um, but here's the thing. I mean, Lord forbid that I should ever weaponize the faith against my own flesh and blood in some petty bid to assert myself. Oh, good grief. That's, that's the kind of talk that just makes you sick. That's just, it's nonsense. And again, we exactly what's going on at Corinth, yeah, we, can, we can more or less tell what's going on in the here and now among ourselves. Um, particularly, I can tell with myself, if I'm honest with myself, is my practice of faith meant to... Am I trying to weaponize it in some way? Am I trying to score points? Am I trying to flex against someone else? Am I flexing on my wife? I think that's easier for most of us to determine. Um, easy enough for us to know better whenever we engage in it. And again, Lord forbid we ever do it. I want to end today... By returning to this um, this metaphor of the head that Paul uses throughout, we said earlier that um, these women have lost their heads because of the spiritual gifts that they have received, and there's a sad irony to that, what these women in Corinth are doing. Um, 
When you go back to verse 10, the ESV sadly has butchered the translation of verse 10 by talking about a quote-unquote symbol of authority. Um, there's absolutely nothing in the Greek text to imply the word symbol or that Paul has anything like a symbol in mind. Um, verse 10 says, and this is just my own translation, on account of this, the woman is obliged to have authority over her head or to have power over her head because of the angels. Uh, and if you're curious about the angels, by the way, that's something, th those are in the weeds. Um, and if I get a video together doing the, really getting into the nitty-gritty of this passage. We'll talk about the angels. Um, got a lot to say about the angels. The verse says, on account of this, the woman is obliged to have authority over her head or power over her head. In other words, she needs to control herself. Right? She has lost her head, and she needs to get control of it again. And that's, that's the irony of this. In her bid to assert herself, to exercise power and control, to flex on her husband, this woman has lost control of herself. In her bid to dishonor her head, she has lost her own head. She has fallen ex squarely into the curse of Genesis 3.16. You remember what the Lord tells Eve? Your desire, that is, desire to dominate, shall be for your husband. Right? You're going to want to flex on your husband in this way, right? You're going to think on a fairly regular basis, oh, my word, this doofus. I've got to, I have to align myself with this. I have to identify myself with this. I have to act like Christ acted towards the Father, but I get this. And God tells Eve, that's, that's what you're going to want to do. But that's not the way it's going to play out. And this is the sad irony that befalls all who walk contrary to the gospel. In trying to assert yourself, you lose yourself. Christ shows us a better way. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it, he says. And so we invite all who are seeking their own way to give up that futile pursuit. Give your life over to Jesus Christ and enjoy the peace that comes from knowing him and from living in communion with the saints. We invite you to find a Church of Christ near you. If you're in the St. Petersburg, Florida area, get in contact with us, the 14th Avenue Church of Christ. And wherever you go, we are happy to study the way of Jesus Christ with you. Uh, to study this way of living and this way of thinking that we've been talking about today. And if you are ready to commit yourself to that, to become a Christian, and to live after the ways of Christ, then believe in that good news that he has died for your sins. Turn away from those sins. Repent of them. Confess Jesus as Lord and be baptized into his death, burial, and resurrection for the remission of your sins. I want to thank you for joining us this week, and I pray that this message has encouraged you to a more faithful life in Christ. Uh, and again, I know if, you, if you're coming to this expecting to have like all of the, the puzzling bits of this passage um, answered, uh, I, am, I have sorely disappointed you because I've not even discussed them. <laughs> because I think it really the important thing for us to get to, the essential thing, the first thing, is to find... Uh, that gospel message that Paul is bringing them back to and to find where they've gone astray from it. So, like I said, it is in my plans uh, to, Lord willing, produce a, another video, more of a class style. So there's not really going to be any exhortation in it. There's not going to be an invitation in it. Um, it's going to, in fact, it's going to be fairly academic um, that will address all of these curious bits, like what is the head covering, is it hair? Is it a hairdo? Um, what's this bit about shaving the head? What's up with dudes with long hair? And yeah, I know you don't have to say it. You'd just be talking to your TV anyway. Um, what is it? What's with this thing with the angels? 
what about the argument from nature? Um, you know, what, what does Paul mean by any of that? Um, how do we square this with 1 Corinthians 14 and talking about uh, women being silent in the assembly? Those are all things that, again, Lord willing, uh, plan on taking on in a more academic sense um, in an upcoming video. So, in our sermon series, we look forward to seeing you next week as we look at Paul's instructions concerning the Lord's Supper. Um, and these, I think, are considerably simpler, easier to understand. So we look forward to seeing you then. Until next time, take care. Bye-bye.